Hello chaps and chapettes, I hope you're all well, and welcome to this, a look at a special kind of applique armour, known as plastic armour. Now, we'll move on to the use of this armour on the M4 and M26 tanks soon, but to start this tale I need to start, well, at the start. And that is with its use in the Royal Navy and their merchant fleet. At the start of the Second World War in 1939, the merchant fleet were feeling a little naked, especially to the modern threat to shipping, that of the plane, which was often equipped with high calibre machine guns and cannons, which with one strafe of the bridge could cripple the average merchant ship and leave its crew injured or dead. A solution was formed by the Admiralty, that of placing large concrete slabs over the vital areas of the ship, up to 152mm thick. You may think this is a good idea, and the Admiralty, did indeed think it. However, the lack of testing proved to be a little embarrassing. They had not tested the paving stones against things like armour-piercing bullets, which proved to be a disaster. The planes and the S-boats were a huge threat to the merchant fleet, and casualties rose sharply. In an area called Steps, Edward Terrell, a bit of an inventor in his spare time, and a man of the law for his workday, he was recu recruited as a lieutenant into the special branches of the Royal Navy, with some luck which gave him the chance to investigate the damage to merchant fleets from enemy gunfire. He saw the failure of concrete firsthand and wanted to find a way to avoid these brave sailors who were effectively sailing to a hail of bullets with nothing more than a pair of underwear to protection, giving them a chance to survive. A moment of fortune struck in the horrors of the Dunkirk invasion. One of the old paddle steamers that had taken part in the operation was hit multiple times by shells and bullets, but received very few casualties and damages. A note read, I noticed that whenever MG bullets struck the deck, there were no ricochets. The surface of the deck is covered with a cork-filled mastic substance to aid in waterproofing. A conclusion came that the asphalt in the corking agent was likely to have aided. A call was made and samples were received. Good fortune struck again at the Road, re, road Research Station at uh, Hammondsworth. Head of the station, William Glanville, was there and between himself and Terrell they replaced the cork filled asphalt with a metal sheet backing and rocks. The issue with cork was the bullets were carrying straight, a straight path and once cork was hit, nothing much happened. However, when stones were added, the bullets would deflect slightly, their energy dispersed, and their penetration power completely lost. The final recipe for plastic armour named to one named to one con confused German intelligent, and secondly, due to the fact it was a malleable substance while it was hot, was 55% granite, 38% limestone, and 7% bitumen with a back plate of around 6.4 millimeters of mild steel. The armor was around 100 millimeters in thickness when applied to a ship. The development of this item had taken only 10 days, but it would go on to save thousands of lives on the sea. Now we have that over and done with, let us look at the use of plastic armor in the M4 Sherman and latter the M26 Pershing. Up armouring a tank was nothing new, but was often done in the field by commanders and operators of the vehicle, most notably of course the use of sandbags on the Sherman, but of course this was frowned upon as they were often untested and caused issues with the vehicle they were placed upon. However, the threat of the German Panzerfaust and Panzerschrex shaped charges was starting to grow. The shape charger's ability to punch through armour started to cause concern for all tankers in the field, and their ability to remain hidden until the tank was, well, up in flames caused many to try different ways to counteract them. Over in America, the Flintoke company had an idea to aid with the defence of this new weapon, that of plastic armour. Named HCR1 and HCR2, the armour was placed on the weaker at risk sections of the tank. The side of the Sherman was often seen as an issue and was indeed a very weak against a shape charge round. 
Composite armour was attached to the side of the tanks and around the turret of the vehicle. As tests started at the Aberdeen testing grounds, it was found that the HCR armour was able to achieve the same levels of protection as steel, but with a much, much lighter weight. The two variants consisted of HCR1, 50% aluminium, 40% asphalt or pitch, 10% wood flour. HCR2, 80% quartz gravel, 5% wood flour, 15% asphalt or pitch. Both backed with aluminium plates. The favoured HCR2 was a fairly hefty item to be fixed to the tank at around 250mm thick and added around 8 tonnes of extra weight to the M4. Testing had been fairly positive, however, with the turret capable of almost defeating the fearsome 88mm shape charged rockets. However, some penetration would still make it through the applique armour. The next testing was against the 76mm M1 HVAP, a very capable gun and round combination, capable of punching through nearly 180mm of armour. The plastic armour actually fared well against kinetic rounds, although it was found it did not aid as much as the equivalent in weight of high grade steel. Another issue came with high explosive hits to HCR2. The armour was attached via cables, and these cables would often fail after being hit by explosive rounds, along with the plastic armour itself either falling off or getting damaged to a point it was no longer available to offer the same protection. Despite being a successful item and easy to, easily available to be attached to Allied tanks, the project was actually abandoned, the main reason being the low probability of a Panzerfaust or Panzerschreck becoming a serious threat. Personally, I feel this was a bit of a misplay, as they could have really aided in urban combat, but the other issue that came with the heavier plique armour was the reduction of mobility, speed and durability of the tank, with the extra weight on board, all of which I'm sure counted to ending this project quite soon. The fact that it caused mechanical issues to the vehicles was probably the main reason it was scrapped. Although we would see similar systems come back to the tanks and are now a main feature of almost all MBTs, um, it was sort of abandoned for many years and didn't really come back into sort of notoriety until sort of the 70s and 80s and then it's gone on leaps and bounds of course. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this little footnote in armour history. It's not a big video, not a big detailed one in all honesty because there's not really much detail to go through but it is an interesting one nonetheless. Plastic armour would go on to save thousands of sailors lives and it could have aided in many tankers lives as well in an urban combat environment but as stated the fact it slowed the vehicle down did cause some issues. Alright guys thank you so much for watching I hope you've enjoyed this one and I will see you all next time. This is me Carl Screezilla wishing you all the best. Bye bye!